So welcome everybody. I'm delighted you could all join today. Um, I'm Lisa. I work as an investor at Bloomberg Beta, a venture capital fund focused on the future of work, where we invest in anything that makes work more effective, more productive and humane. And to the privilege of interviewing Jason Crawford, a writer, thinker and educator on progress studies, and if you haven't checked out his blog already, it really is a fantastic resource. Um, it's rootsofprogress.org. Um, Jason has spent the past few years deeply exploring the progress space, and I've personally learned so much from him. So we're going to start the conversation today, um, figuring out what progress is, and then hopefully dive in deeper to some meatier topics. So Jason, what is Progress Studies and why did you get involved? Yeah, sure. Um, we should, maybe we should start with what is progress? Um, I define progress very simply as anything that helps us live our lives better, um, anything that creates more wealth and abundance, uh, more connectedness between people or to knowledge, uh, increases our choices and options, or you know gives us more health and safety. And progress studies is the idea that uh, this is an ongoing process and it's something that we can learn more about and maybe something that we can do something about. Um, is progress happening as fast as it used to? Why was there so little progress for thousands of years and then suddenly it took off in the last couple hundred years? Um, and how do we keep it going and you know and even accelerate it? Um, and and how do we make sure progress is something that's you know that's that's good for humanity the way it's been actually net good for others for us over the last couple hundred years? Those are sort of the key I would say the key questions of progress studies. And why did you get involved? I mean, it sounds like a huge topic, but can you just share a bit more about your personal journey and um, what you've been working on for the past few years? Yeah, totally. So my training and most of my career was in tech. Um, I went to school for computer science. I was a tech, uh, you know, I was a, a engineer and a software engineer and manager and a tech startup founder for a long time. And um, then just on the side, really it started out as a reading project and, and grew into a hobby. I started reading about the history of progress. And I was just absolutely fascinated and kind of got obsessed with it. And so after I left my last, last tech job and asked myself, what do I really want to do next? Um, the thing I was you know, interested in more than anything else was the, the blog I was writing, The Roots of Progress, and, and learning this history of how we got here. You know, What were the major discoveries and inventions that created the modern world? Where did they come from? Why did we create them? What problems did they solve? Those are the things that I'm really um, you know, passionate about exploring and writing about right now. And I know, obviously, Tyler Cowen and Patrick Collinson came out with this big sort of blog post about progress studies um, as a field that we can actually study and think about from sort of an educational perspective. I'd love to just hear a little bit more about how you think progress studies relates to other fields in terms of, you know, we have history, we have economics. How do you think about the framing of progress studies? And should there be a progress studies department at universities? Like, how, how should we think about it? Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm laughing at you. You referred to it as a big blog post. It was actually an article <laughs> in The Atlantic. Um, it came out a little over a year ago last summer, uh, written by Tyler Cowan and, and Patrick Collison, um, who I think a lot of people are, are familiar with. Uh, they kind of kicked off this whole notion of progress studies. So it was that article that coined the term progress studies and, and called for its existence and called for more focus on this idea. Um, yeah, it's relationship to other fields. I mean, uh, so we already have lots of re relevant fields, right? We have history, we have economics, we have economic history, we have um, the history and philosophy of science, we have management studies and, you know, all sorts of things like that, right? Um, no shortage of relevant fields. I think what uh, Cowan and Collison were calling for in that article was one, a bit of a more interdisciplinary focus. So each of those fields can get a little siloed in its own topics and methods. And you really want something that cuts across all of them and integrates concerns from all of them. Um, and the other thing was they called for something that's a little more uh, prescriptive, not merely descriptive, um, but something that is to, you know, as medicine is to biology or engineering to physics, something that actually tells us, okay, so what? What should we do? What can we do? Um, what actions should we take ultimately to, um, you know, to drive progress forward in a good way? And as you think about it, what role do you think universities should play in this? Like, should they have departments? Like, how, how do you think about who, who should be the people educating us on progress studies and sort of moving that forward? Because you've done so much um, yourself. I'm not sure that, uh, you know, progress studies should be a a field per se. I think of it more as a sort of school of thought that, a, that conditions how you approach any one of these disciplines. Um, it's, uh, it's basically just a, a, a set of 
premises and values about what matters and what's important. Um, it's basically the idea that progress is real, it's important, it's basically good, we should have more of it if we can, and that uh, it, it ultimately comes from human choices and actions, and so we should, you know, we should study, uh, you know, what we can do about it, um, and whether uh, there's a way to sort of keep driving this trend forward, like understanding the causes so that we can affect them. Um, and I think you can approach any of the disciplines that I mentioned with that mindset, um, so uh, I'm not, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert in academia. I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to say how uh, academic departments should be organized. But I think people from all of those different fields, um, as well as people like me who are outside of academia, I mean, I'm not an academic myself, um, uh, but all of us can approach, uh, you know, can approach these topics with that sort of progress mindset. All right, let's, I'd love to dive into sort of, I think the cultural aspects of progress and then the more economic aspects of progress. Um, and I guess in light of the recent election, um, and we've seen a lot of public nostalgia for the past, you know, past sort of image of making America great again, um, you know, perhaps being the most obvious manifestation of that. Do you think there's not that much public enthusiasm for progress? And if, if that is the case, why do you think that is? Do you think we've traded progress for something else? Hmm. Um I think I would look separately at the political versus the scientific and technological fronts. I think moral front, people are often hearkening to a past age. Uh, people don't take social, social change very well. They often think that is a, there's a degradation of morals from, uh, you know, from, from their youth or from, from past generations. Um, you know, even in the Victorian period, people were looking back to the Middle Ages as what a romantic age of chivalry that was, you know. So, um, and they aren't always wrong, but I think it's just, you should just know that sort of people are always kind of hearkening to, the, to a, a, a more golden past when it comes to politics and morality. Um, I think what's more interesting and, and, uh, and has swung harder perhaps back and forth is people's approach to science and technology and whether technology is making the world a better place. Um, I think that in say the late uh, 19th century, you know, so late 1800s into early 1900s, especially, was an age where the entire culture was very positive on progress. That doesn't mean that every advance was welcomed with open arms. I would say every, pretty much every major advance in history has been fought and opposed by somebody. Um, but the 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 general public, I think, had a very positive attitude toward, towards uh, technology, progress, and growth. It was seen as um, you know, mankind striding forward, right? And very, just think of that very, very kind of late 19th century feel. Um, you look at the posters from the World's Fair in the early, you know, 1900s and just kind of the very romantic view people had of technology and progress. And I think that lasted, you know, at least up until the 30s or 40s, maybe the 50s, certainly by the 60s, uh, the 1960s in the U.S., and I think, and I think broader, you start to see that really changing, and you see the rise of the counterculture, and part of what they were counter was progress. And so, ever since then, I think there's been much more of an influence of a much more, uh, you know, nervous or negative uh, or or you know, anti sort of a, t a technology and progress backlash. Mm. And um, you know, and I can't. This is one of the things that I believe, but I can't prove yet. Which is that, um, I mean, I think that has had serious effects on how much progress we actually get um, because you get more of what you value and, uh, and less of what you disdain. So with your research, what do you think could, what we could change to popularize progress, like in the cultural sphere at the very least? Yeah, I think we need to start the very basic foundation. The starting point is to just tell the history, tell the actual story of progress, tell what happened. Um, show where we started from, make clear the, the, uh, you know, the living conditions that people had just a couple hundred years ago um, and how far we've come, how much better our lives are today, thanks to mass manufacturing, thanks to powered transportation, thanks to vaccines and antibiotics, thanks to electronic communications and the internet. All of these things, you know, together have made our lives uh, just, you know, fantastic compared to a couple hundred years ago. And I think that story is not told in a way that makes it really clear to people. Um, and I think, uh, you know, you should tell the good along with the bad, right? So acknowledge the ways that progress is messy, 
um, the ways that progress is sometimes, you know, a couple steps forward and, and maybe one or two steps back, um, or the ways we make things better in some ways, but they get worse in other ways. Um, acknowledge all of that and uh, and figure out how to how do we grapple with that sort of complexity, right? And how do we how do we actually evaluate um, progress overall uh, on on whole on the whole on balance? Um, I think that's where to start, and that's why I've started on in my writing and my educational work with um, just going back to the basic history. What happened? What were the major advances and developments? What problems did they solve? Why was it so hard to grow food? Why were so many did so many people need to be farmers and we still had periodic famines, right? Why was it so hard to protect against disease? Why was it that infectious disease killed like half of everybody, pretty much? Um, you know, why, why did it take so long for us to invent any form of transportation that goes faster than a horse or a, or a sailing ship? You know, these are these are sort of the very basic questions that I'm interested in. And I like to dig into and and write the whole you know geeky story of, and I, I think that's really where it starts. Tell those stories. That's the foundation of doing any further sort of understanding or analysis. If you don't start with that, then any kind of analysis of um, uh, you know, of, is progress good or bad, et cetera, is just you're just basing it on on air, you know, on a, on a, on a vacuum, right? Because you don't have the substantive facts at your disposal to really answer those questions. And I think then once you tell that story. I mean, I think it's a fascinating and inspiring story. And when you tell it, I think, you know, people who are listening and pay attention uh, will, will will start to get inspired and start to see how good progress can be. Yeah, I mean, you wrote a blog post on industrial literacy, and I think that like concept kind of stuck with me too. I'm curious, I mean, you've been exploring this space for a number of years now. What do you think the most surprising thing you've learned is? And this could be, you know, from you know, people not knowing about sort of the basics to to anything. Yeah, let's see. Well, I'd say one of the things that I've sort of changed my mind on is when I got into this, I was actually um, somewhat skeptical of the stagnation hypothesis. So this is the idea that uh, technological progress has actually slowed down in the last 50 years or so, say since about 1970. Um, for some people, this is like the main motivation for progress studies. For me, I was just fascinated with the whole, you know, 300 year history of the industrial age. Uh, and as I got into it, I started hearing about this, oh, there's this idea that uh, things have slowed down. Tyler Cowen talks about this. Robert Gordon famously wrote a book, Rise and Fall of American Growth. Peter Thiel has talked about this a lot. And, uh, you know, at first I was like, no, come on, there's still lots of progress. Look at computers, look at the internet, look at all the things that have happened. Progress is still going on. And um, slowly I've come around. And so now I'm actually fairly convinced that, yeah, uh, uh, it's not that progress has stopped, of course. It's not that there's been zero progress. Um, or it's not that the progress that has happened has been insignificant. But there was just a lot more going on in that uh, period. Again, late 1800s to early 1900s. Here's the simplest way to, and most convincing, I think, way to think about it. In that period, um, late 18 to early 1900s, we had, by my count, approximately four major technological revolutions all going on at once. Um, we had electricity, we had uh, oil and the internal combustion engine, we had uh, chemical engineering and the, and the results of actually applying chemistry to, to industry, and we had the germ theory and its ramifications. All four of those were basically coming to fruition at once around the end of the 1800s. And each one was directly transforming, you know, one or two major areas of, of the industry and then having ramifications on the entire world. In the last 50 years, we've basically had one of those, right? We've had computers and the internet. And that has had a direct transformative effect on one industry, which is communications and, and information processing generally. And it's had indirect ramifications on the whole world. But you know you don't have to um, you don't have to downplay the effects and the magnitude of the computer and internet revolution in order to see that one major revolution does not stack up against four sort of equivalently major revolutions all going on at once. Not to mention, by the way, what comes next? The computer and internet revolution is only going to pay you know high dividends for so long. Every one of these things lasts you know fifty to seventy years or so, hits an S curve and sort of levels off and plateaus and it hits diminishing returns. So what comes next to replace computers and the internet and and keep giving us growth once that plateaus? You know the only thing worse than going from four revolutions to one is going from one to zero. So that's sort of what I'm worried about. And so. I want to like dive a bit deeper into why we why things are slowing down. Like, what do you think the bottlenecks? Um, I know you've spoken previously about government and bureaucracy, and so describe that a little bit more and talk to me about how 
you think we we could try and accelerate progress yeah um uh, right now i have three major hypotheses for the slowdown and um i mean i don't think it's any one of them i think it's basically all of them uh one is what we talked about a little bit already which is culture what is the um the value and honor and prestige and social status given to science and technology uh and and business entrepreneurship um and and driving industry forward and I think that is, you know, less than it used to be. And so I think we get less talent and enthusiasm and energy and investment going into those areas. Um, two would be uh, a sort of creeping, you know, backlog of the regulatory state of just all, you know, the enormous amount of bureaucracy that we have added, um, a lot of it from government regulation. But, um, you know, I think some of it winds its way into even private uh, the way private entities get bureaucratized, if you look at any university uh, today and the bureaucracy that they have built up around, you know, sort of doing anything, I just think we've built up a lot of overhead. Um, and a lot of that might be uh, justified on grounds of or motivated by safety concerns. And I worry that our concern with safety, and by the way, safety is uh, one of the great achievements of the industrial age. Um, Technology actually, it creates a lot of risks, but it also can create a lot of safety and has created a lot of safety for us in many ways. But I just have this hunch that it's gone overboard and that we've gone beyond safety. We've gone into safety theater. And so we're, you know, we have a lot of overhead, uh, sort of bureaucratic overhead that adds a lot of um, friction and slows everything down, but does not actually add a lot of safety. Um, and then the third thing the, uh, that I would look at, the third major hypothesis would be how we fund, organize, and manage research and development. And especially I would push, sort of point to the, the centralization and bureaucratization of research funding. Um, after World War II in the United States, the federal government um, basically took over research funding and is now kind of, the, uh, uh, I think, the majority, um, certainly NIH is like the majority of academic funding for life sciences. It's a $40 billion organization. Um, and, you know, everything in the NIH basically goes through peer review and, uh, and uh, you know, in a committee. And this is exactly the sort of thing that leads to, well, there's just the friction and the overhead, but also even worse, I'm afraid. Uh, it's the sort of thing that leads to consensus and groupthink and uh, exactly the sort of thing that can kill ambitious ideas, especially ideas that challenge the status quo, which is exactly where breakthroughs come from. Um, this is, I believe, more or less the argument of a new book that was just re-released by Stripe Press uh, by, uh, I believe the name is Donald Robin, uh, Scientific Freedom, the Elixir of Civilization. I've only read the introduction so far, but it, you know, it seems right on this thesis. Um, there was also, I would say all three of these um, hypotheses are described in a book that I just reviewed at the Roots of Progress called Where Is My Flying Car uh, by JSTORS Hall, which is uh, a, a a pretty uh, entertaining and informative uh, look at a lot of these topics. So actually, I want to dive into the sort of funding aspect of things, because I know you've looked at this quite deeply. There's two questions here. Who should fund innovation and scientific progress and how should we fund it? Um, so I'd love to understand who you think should be funding this and how how should it work? Hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, it's... It's a tough problem. The um, uh, the central challenge, I think, is sort of um, there's sort of a tension or a trade off between like the VC startup model and the nonprofit model, whether it's um, whether it's even private or government. I actually see um, I see in general private nonprofits as um, having maybe many of the same challenges as government funding. Um, uh, if not if not the same moral hazards, you know, perhaps of spending taxpayers' money. But, um, you know, the the, the for profit world has done, I think, a pretty good job of funding a uh, a very broad uh, set of projects, a sort of diversified portfolio of different ideas. Um, not everybody has to agree to get a for-profit, you know, a startup funded, right? There are dozens of VCs out there and you really only have to get one to say yes. So that helps you avoid a lot of the, the, the decentralization of that system helps you avoid a lot of the sort of consensus and groupthink problems. Um, not to mention that uh, VCs also have a particular uh, incentive to, to get in early, right? And I think this is actually, I think something that's highly underappreciated. 
in for-profit investing, you are highly monetarily incentivized to be right early, to say yes to something, even when it looks like a bad idea to everyone else, and when it's highly uncertain, risky, and not at all, you know, guaranteed to succeed. And that is exactly when, you know, new ideas need uh, protection and, and support the most. Um, I, I've heard this a couple of slices, so I don't know who said it first, but, you know, new ideas are fragile. Um, they come into the world and it's very, very easy to kill new ideas. And so, you know, new ideas need support and protection. And uh, in, in VC, the way that we motivate that is that, you know, if you, if you are right early on a breakthrough idea, you can have a thousand X return. And that can make up for a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of failures, of course. There is no such quantitative mechanism in nonprofit funding. Again, either private or government funding. There's no way in which a funder who says yes to something that everybody else thought was a stupid idea is going to get, you know, their their bet paid off a thousand x in terms of in terms of what credibility, prestige. Um, you know, what, what the the currency is different. The currency is not monetary returns. It's something more like social status, and we just can't measure social status well enough to, you know, to even, you know, to, to give people a thousand X return on it. Um, and similarly on the flip side, right, you can imagine, you know, if there's some NIH committee that said no to work that, you know, later on somehow gets funded by somebody else and, and, and wins a Nobel prize. There's no mechanism that I know of where that NIH committee that said no ever, uh, you know, ever has any sort of self-reflection or, or means to correct the error. Whereas if a VC passes on a seed stage company that goes on to become the next Google, you know, they're going to remember that sting for, for the, you know, for the rest of their career. Um, so that's, I think, the real tension. Now, the, the problem with for-profit investing is, uh, one, you got to capture value, and it can be very hard to capture value on, you know, basic scientific research, right? You can't mm. even, you can't patent scientific discoveries. Um, and the time horizon is extremely long, right? It can be decades from uh, a scientific discovery to ultimate economic payoff. And, you know, most VCs today are set up uh, to work on something like a 10 year, 12 year, uh, you know, maybe 15 year fund horizon. There are some, you know, experiments going on with longer um, time horizons. I, I do believe that could be overcome, but it's certainly not the norm. So, um, so I think maybe the biggest challenge in funding progress is that, um, some things fall into the cracks, right? Where they are, uh, they can't produce a, a clear monetary return within a 10 year time frame, uh, and so making them not a great fit for for profit. And yet at the same time, they're these kind of maverick, non consensus, low prestige ideas um, that can easily get shut out of, uh, you know, non profit uh, things that are that are fall prey to consensus and groupthink. So that's it's, the challenge. I don't know how to solve it yet. But. Yeah, it's really interesting. When you were talking, I was thinking quite deeply about, you know, the people who maybe make the inventions aren't going to capture and apply it to industry. And so you kind of have to really figure out this, this whole model, which is incredibly complicated. What do you think government could do to sort of improve the mechanisms? I mean, especially as you think about the recent election of President-elect Biden, even though, you know, we're figuring out the details there, are you hopeful for the US government to sort of help um, reform or like, what would you recommend if you could um, about how to accelerate progress? Hmm. Um, I'm not hopeful, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, because I think the, I mean, I think the problems, you know, again, we're looking at a phenomenon that seems to have been going on for about 50 years. So the problems are not limited to any one administration or any one party or, or, or any one generation. Um, what do I think government can do? Uh, this is a tough one, especially since I tend to personally, my, my biases, I tend to lean very sort of laissez-faire, um, uh, you know, uh, almost libertarian kind of, you know, uh, and so I look at this and I, and I look at the, I look at the government being involved and, and if that, if the centralization and bureaucratization of funding actually has caused a problem, you know, so I, maybe the, the the best thing to do is somehow to figure out how to privatize it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not, I don't have a plan for that and I'm not ready. And I, I don't think I can prove that that's the best um, answer. So, uh, you know, and, nor, and obviously I don't think that would fly right now anyway. So, you know, another, uh, a somewhat less radical proposal that might address part of it 
Um, I saw something on Twitter from Patrick Collison at one point where he said, well, what if we split up the big agencies into, you know, split the centralized agencies into like 10 or 12 independent agencies and incentivize them to perform um, uh, or, or to pursue rather uh, a diverse heterogeneous strategies, right? Just do something to make sure they're not all thinking about it in the same way. And they're thinking about things, you know, quite differently. Um, an even more perhaps uh, concrete, doable near-term proposal would be something like what um, uh, the Day One project proposed. Um, uh, Adam Marblestone uh, wrote uh, uh, something about this proposed uh, this notion of focused research organizations, which are um, you know something in between uh, DARPA and a startup, you know perhaps. <laughs> Um, these sort of organizations that have specific missions, but are really trying to do um, some some transformative technologies. Um, but I, I, you know, high level, I just I think we need to experiment with different forms of how the resources are allocated, um, different ways of managing, and um, you know, something that really allows people to take risks and go pursue ambitious, uh, you know, ambitious projects. What I worry about is that um, this needs a change that is bigger even than policies and institutions, that it almost needs a change in research culture itself. Mm. Um, because, you know, in, again, so to co contrast with my past experience in the startup world, one of the great things about it is that um, failure is okay. Not that it's okay in that it's it's just as good as success. Obviously, success is way, way better. But failure isn't a black mark on your resume. Um, certainly, if you you know if you tried to do a startup and it didn't work out, and everybody thinks you, you you were at least smart and honest in the way that you went about it, you kept your integrity, then you know they'll back you again. Um, and nobody thinks that you're a, a loser or uh, incompetent or never going to make it just because you had a failed startup. Um, my understanding, you know, from what I hear about the academic culture is that it is not as forgiving and you need to be much more, you know, stay on a track and don't have any, don't have a five-year period in your career with uh, where you tried really hard, but didn't have the, you know, associated results to show for it. And ultimately, maybe that is a thing that we need to change. Um, and that takes more than one funding program or institution, right? It takes it takes a whole set of people saying we need to change the way that we evaluate researchers and their careers. Yeah, it actually brings up something interesting I read by um, Tyler Cowen, which was around the COVID-19 response. And he wrote a piece about how we should be championing sort of the UK and sort of that innovation with the COVID-19 response, as opposed to sort of the government measures to manage the population spread. Um, I think like those cultural aspects of sort of what we should be championing is is really interesting. I know we only have a couple of minutes, so I wanted to ask you, um, you know, tell me a little bit more about progress studies for young scholars, because I know this has been a big project of yours um, and I'd love to just hear a little bit more about it. Yeah, sure. Progress studies for young scholars uh, is a uh, basically a high school level uh, course in the history of technology that I developed uh, for higher ground education. Uh, they run a number of schools, including a, uh, they have a set of high schools called the Academy of Thought and Industry. So this is now a course that's uh, being taught through Academy of Thought and Industry. And uh, we ran it over the summer as a summer program, had a, a number of different cohorts of students, um, you know, take the course. And it is now being run as, um, uh, as part of their virtual school and uh, as an after school program for people who already have some other school. So uh, yeah, check out the Academy of Thought and Industry if, uh, if people are interested in that class. And we are, um, hasn't been announced yet, but we are uh, doing the next rev on those materials. And um, I'm excited about what we're working on. We're gonna have a much, an, an even better version um, of the course, but it goes through all the, all the major areas of technology, manufacturing, agriculture, energy, transportation, communication, uh, you know, medicine. Uh, we even have a, a module on safety technologies. And then at the end, we encourage the students to think about the future and what are the remaining you know, challenges and the exciting frontier technologies and how do they want to play a part in the future of progress? How do they want that to be a part of their lives? Uh, because really, you know, progress is something where each generation has to pick up the torch anew and carry it forward. It doesn't happen without people doing that. That's great. Um, and I know we only have a minute left. So... My final question is if um, people listening only took one thing away from this talk, what would you like them to take away? 
Um, progress is real and important, and we need to be ambitious about it because the future can be, you know, can see just as much progress as the past, and our descendants can be as fantastically wealthy compared to us as we are compared to past generations. So let's go for it. I love that. Such an inspiring um, sort of final thought to end this conversation today. Jason, I'm so honored to have had the, the chance to interview you. Um, and it's I great believe... to be here. Thanks for having me.